Thank you, Chairperson, for the kind introduction. Uh, my topic is the place of novel triple fixed drug combination of cetagliptin, dapagliflozin, and metformin in the management of type 2 diabetes. So this slide has been taken from the IDF Atlas 2021 and this is looking at the prevalence of people with diabetes in various countries, the top 10 countries and India comes second at the moment 2021 and it has also been extrapolated 2045 and we still are num at number 2 but the number has really gone up from 74 to 124.9 million people and this is a, a very recent uh, study from the pub published in public health 2022 and it's looking at the prevalence awareness treatment and control of diabetes from a countrywide national non-communicable disease monitoring survey and what does it show it is basically looking at a distribution of fasting glucose across the urban rural men and women categories and you see as the age goes up, whether it was the urban population sorry, or the rural population or the, uh, sorry, the men or the women, all of them showed as the age goes up, the prevalence of diabetes, that is the red box at the top of the bar, keeps on increasing. And when you look at these prevalence of diabetes as such, that is the red bar again, if you look across the spectrum of BMI from underweight to normal BMI to overweight to obese, all of them show as the progression of BMI happens, there is a progressive increase in the, in the prevalence of diabetes in our country. Now, this is a very alarming study, this was done some uh, six to seven years back and it showed that only 33.1% of diabetic population was really under the control and had a target value of HbA1c less than 7. And nearly 62.5% of these population were above the target PPBG of more than 180. So this alarming slide should keep us on our toes and we need to look at what this uncontrolled diabetes is going to do to us right across blindness, heart attack, brain hemorrhage, kidney problems, amputation of low extremities, all sorts of complications we all know can happen if we are not going to control our diabetes. So there is an importance of glycemic control. All our patient needs to be well controlled and there is a long way to go, especially looking at our Indian population. We have a lot of data which suggests that if we control the diabetes in our patient, we are going to control most of the microvascular complications. But despite that, despite this awareness among the physicians, despite this knowledge being percolated down to the patients, we are still not able to reach the target. What could be the reason and how we can we overcome these things? Clinical inertia is one of the major reasons for uncontrolled glycemic control. And what is this clinical inertia? It is the failure of the healthcare providers to initiate or intensify therapy when indicated. And to, this could be because of so many reasons. There could be an overestimation of care. We think that patient is already taking too many medications. We don't want to add anything more. Use a far soft reason to avoid intensification of therapy. And then, of course, there could be lack of education, training, and a, simply a clinical inertia on the, on the part of the physician not to accelerate or intensify the therapy. Another important thing why we are not able to control is that we are not looking at the whole spectrum of the pathophysiology that these patients might be having. We are targeting just one of the pathophysiology. We are just leaving out the rest of them. So at the end of the day, we are probably not getting the results that we really want. If we can target most of the pathophysiological defects, probably we will not just be able to control the hyperglycemia, but we will also probably be able to reduce the complications that are going to happen because of that. Early use of combination therapy is being avoided by most physicians and we already know that if you use them together, there is increased chances that a third drug may not be required for a very long time. That means this combination can give you more durability, less chances that even if the patient doesn't come back to you, probably he'll get a control and will remain on control for a longer period of time. But if you are not looking at the durability of the combination, then these patients who are not going to come back to you will probably land up with hyperglycemia, 
very soon. So combination therapy is the answer to if we are really interested in achieving the target. What are the advantages? There is increasing evidence and rationale that increasing the durability of the glycemic effect potential to address the therapeutic inertia. So even you have inertia from the part of the patient, if you can give a combination therapy, probably you can to some extent overcome this inertia. Patient is already doing two drugs, a durable combination, so patient may not require very frequent visit to the, to the physician and the physician doesn't require to increase the dose with every visit. Simultaneous targeting of the multiple pathophysiologic process is also very important. If you're not going to do that, we're just going to target one particular pathophysiology and leave out the rest, probably will not be doing justice to our patient. Potential impact of medication, of course, the burden, giving multiple number of tablets, the, the cost of the tablet, adherence and other things are very important. And of course, the complementary clinical benefits. It is not just looking at the glucose, but probably looking at the weight, the cardiovascular risk profile in these patients. So combination therapy has now come to stay. And this is what the guidelines recommend in 2022. The ADA guidelines for type 2 diabetes said early combination therapy can be considered in some patients at treatment initiation, treatment initiation itself to extend the time of treatment failure. The NICE guidelines are looking at monotherapy, dual therapy, triple therapy and they do agree that these drugs can be combined together rationally, logically to achieve a durable control of glycemia. If you look at the combination therapies, when are they being prescribed in our patients? You look at the HbA1c level. So, uh, in East Asia, if you look at the bar diagram, you'll find that the East Asia, they start combination therapy the moment the patient's HbA1c go to 7.7. .7. Across Europe, Latin America and Middle East, of course, the values are much higher. In India, it is nearly 8.6 HbA1c before we start its combination therapy. We are waiting for the hb ones to go to up 8.6 and this is where we are lagging and this is going to result in more complication down the line. So what, coming back to this combination, DAPA, CETA, metformin, combination helps in controlling the ominous octet involved in pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So when you are using these three drugs together, the first part of the durability will always be there because you're using a DPP-4 inhibitor and metformin combination, which we already know through the verified trial that this gives a good durability to the, uh, uh, the patient, uh, patient's treatment. And on the other hand, when you use these three drugs, you are basically targeting so many pathophysiological process at one go. SGH2 inhibitors, we all know, they are of intermediate to high efficacy. There is no incidence of hypoglycemia, so you can give them very easily. This combination will not produce any hypoglycemia. If the patient doesn't come back to you, you are not, should not be worried too much about the hypoglycemia part. Patients will have a durable control, probably would not require too much of titration and continue with this triple drug combination for a longer period of time. This is very important in those group of patients who are a bit, what you call, um, careless about the treatment, careless about the visit to the physician, probably they don't even get their some tested and probably they'll never come back to the doctor for years together. So this type of a drug which does not produce hypoglycemia, no major weight gain, lot of CV benefits are there, progression to DKD is also there. So we have already given protection for CV, protection for cardiac benefits right from the very beginning. So the, even the patient who will not come to back to you very soon probably will still continue to have the benefits. The DPP-4 inhibitors, the efficacy is intermediate, there is still no hypoglycemia, no weight change, again a very good drug, very safe drug, can be prescribed for a long period of time. And of course, metformin we already know, it is of high efficacy, so even if the SGLT inhibitors and DPP-4 may not be very strong glucose lowering agents, addition of metformin can really make this drug a very powerful anti-hyperglycemic. Then there are complementary glucose lowering activities. When you are using a DPP-4 inhibitor and SGLT2 inhibitor together in type 2 diabetes, you find that SGLT2 inhibitors produces glucosuria and cause less of glucotoxicity 
and has got indirect effect on the pancreas by causing increased beta cell sensitivity and also decreases the glucagon. Sorry, increases the glucagon. While DPP4 causes increased insulin secretion and lowers the glucagon. So both the benefits can be seen and the, of course the incretin effect is already there with DPP4. So this combination can reduce the chances of hypoglycemia even if it's going to happen because of this uh, glucagon increasing effect of SGLT2 inhibitors. Additional clinical benefits have been seen when cetagliptin is added on to therapy with apagliflozin. This was studied in this published in Diabetes Care, which showed a sustained reduction in glycemic parameters, body weight, and with no risk of hypoglycemia. This is a very important part of this combination. Triple therapy is associated with significant reduction in HbA1c levels relative to dual therapy with DPP4 inhibitor metformin and thera dual therapy of dapagliflozin metformin. That simply means that you are using three drugs together. Definitely, it is, I think, very rational that the HbA1 reduction will be more as compared to a two-drug combination. So this was a study again published diabetes care looking at dapagliflozin as an add-on therapy to cetagliptin with or without metformin. And they showed that the, there was definite improvement when dapagliflozin was added to cetagliptin. HbA1c went down from 0.1 to 0.6. HbA1c patient is achieving an HbA1c target. Uh, the baseline was 0. Baseline more than 8% had a further reduction of another 0.3. Fasting glucose went down by 26 milligram percent, two hours post glucose from 2.6 to went down 43.7 and percent of patient with decrease, those who were achieving the target of less than HbA1c from placebo cetagliptin combination was just 17.2 and it went down to 25, it went up to 25.6. So this combination is going to give you all the advantages which are not available with a dual therapy. And of course, over and above, there is additional benefit of weight loss across the broad range of treatment, whether you are using as a monotherapy, whether you are using as an add-on to metformin, add-on to sulfonylurea, add-on to DPP-4 inhibitor, add-on to insulin. Whenever you are using this drug, in comparison with any of these combinations, you will find that weight loss is much more. The red line looks at the combination and the blue line is the comparator drugs. Another advantage of this combination would be blood pressure reduction. Significant mean changes from baseline in systolic in patients with DAPA metformin related to placebo with metformin at 24 weeks. So this drug, DAPA metformin, can also lead to a better blood pressure reduction. And another advantage is that when you use these two drugs together, the chances of genitourinary infection also goes down because of SGLT2 inhibitor. So in this uh, forest plot, you see the the, all these studies, whether from Rosenstock, Methai, Dufranzo, Tenhaus, Levin, all of them show when you are using this combination and they favor an SGLT2 inhibitor DPP4 combination as, com as compared to SGLT2 inhibitor, the chances of genital unity infection goes down considerably. So there's a paradigm shift in the management of type 2 diabetes from the glucose-centric to more person-centric. We need to not just look at the glucose, but also to look at certain other comorbidities and risk. We know that as you had inhibitor, a full success story across the whole spectrum of LVF. We have so many studies now to prove, right from those in the preclinical stage of heart failure to the clinical stage of disease to detectable cardiac involvement, all these stages have shown number of studies to prove their point that SGLT2 inhibitors definitely have an advantage over the other drugs as far as heart failure reduction and hospitalization for heart failure is concerned. Cetagliptin, of course, has also shown in the TECOS trial there is cardiovascular safety. So when you are looking at the drug combination, looking at the chances of bringing down the glucose, bringing down the risk for hospitalization for heart failure and heart failure, and also for cardio safety, then we need to look at the com combination bringing down the risk for chronic kidney disease. So this was a study which was published again in Diabetology 2022 and it's looking at the uh, addition of glucose lowering medication in people with chronic kidney disease. 
and what does it say? The SGLT2 inhibitors with primary evidence of reducing CKD progression. Use SGLT2 inhibitors with people with an EGFR more than 20 ml. Now the uh, limit has gone, gone down to 20 ml per minute. So now we have a large number of patients who can really be given the advantage of SGLT2 inhibitors, even those who are in a pretty late stage of chronic kidney disease. And once initiated, should be continued until there is a dialysis or transplantation. So you can, if you have been started, don't stop it. GLP-1 RA can also be given if case the SGLT2 inhibitors are not tolerated or contraindicated. So in conclusion and recommendation, in people with CKD, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RA reduce the risk of MACE dependent of EGFR. They reduce the risk of heart failure and kidney outcomes. And in people with CKD and even with the EGFR of up to 20 ABL and SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit, important thing is to remember the proven benefit. We have very recently just two medicines in the SGLT2 inhibitor group. That was the DAPA and the, and the canagliflozin, which were considered to be renal beneficial drugs, but now empagliflozin with the empa kidney study has already been published, and so it has also shown the similar type of results. So all three medicines now show proven benefit as far as the renal concerns, uh, reductions are concerned. And if such treatment is not contraindicated, uh, con not tolerated or contraindicated, only then you need to put a patient on GLP-1. So SGLT inhibitors have now come to stay, a very important group of drugs in all patients of chronic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, but also in patients who do not have diabetes, but have chronic kidney disease. So overall summarizing the talk, a triple drug fixed dose combination of metformin, cetagliptin and DAPA, that is metformin with a DPP-4 inhibitor and an SGLT2 inhibitor. First of all, it improves the compliance that we were talking of, reduces the clinical inertia that we were talking of, increases the durability of the treatment that we were considering, address most of the pathophysiological defects of the ominous octet, achieve weight reduction, provide cardio-renal benefits including reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, and also minimize the adverse effect of individual therapy like genitourinary infection. So it provides therapy which optimizes the quality of the life of a person living with diabetes. Thank you for your patient listening.